Okay, so this video is something that I am doing for the first time, which is talking about the tracker knife and involving my father. Um, I did do a YouTube video that a lot of people have seen where I talk about this story, but I wanted to actually interview my father since he is the designer of the original tracker knife and get his responses to some of the questions about the story. So thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. Sounds interesting. Yes. Um, so uh, to start out, you, uh, you picked up knife making as a hobby pretty much back in what, the mid 70s? Early 70s. Early 70s. Mm -hmm. Uh, what kind of work did you do as a full-time job? Oh, I was a university professor and administrator. Pretty much took care of uh, all my f time. So I had a little time, and as a hobby, I've, I've made knives. Of course, I, I had made some very simple things even before the 70s, but never really got serious about knives. And I thought the most universal tool I think that humans have is a knife. And I wanted to try my hand and see what they look like. I like working in metal. Yeah. And I've had that same thought many times. I was going to ask how, why did you start knife making? And that, mm -hmm. uh, I agree with you that the knife is man's probably oldest tool. Oldest tool other than the stick and the, and the, yeah. the club. Yeah, the spear. But we go back to early stone knives, and you're right. The knife was man's most basic tool, and to this day remains uh, something that we, if 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 most people are like me, they've got one at least one in their pocket every day. If, I have one in my pocket, if not two or three. Uh, so it's a tool that we use a lot, and uh, so you decided to learn how to make knives. How did you how did you learn how to make knives? I discovered a book uh, called Knife Making by David Boy. It looked interesting, and, and it, in fact, that was probably my biggest influence was that book. Mm -hmm. It wasn't written by uh, an academic. It was down to earth, and he had done everything he said to do himself. And I got uh, inspired from the book started making them and i uh i also went on to learn from this same book years later uh and he at the time was kind of a uh had the attitude of recycling things so he he made knives from old saw blades and mm -hmm. files and whatever he could where find. he could find metal yeah yeah tool metal tool steel tool steel right and so you did you start out that way using recycled materials in a in a way i i found old pieces of saw blades and things and kind of experimented but it wasn't long before i decided that uh, a better way would be to get some good pieces of annealed steel that i could start with right annealing what were some of the types of steel that you used i started with just regular old Oh, one. <laughs> Good carbon steel. Carbon steel. And <clears throat> and as I got into it, I discovered that there was <clears throat> a lot of steel available, different types of steel. Mostly, I was looking for stainless because, of course, carbon, carbon steel rusts, and you have to be careful to clean it off and wipe it off and things, mm. but it's easy to sharpen. Yeah. Then I got into some pretty sophisticated st stainless steels. I, I remember distinctly that, uh, now at the time, at the time you were starting to make knives, I was a teenager. So I remember, I remember it well. I remember this hobby of yours starting up and how I would watch you in your shop and watch you work. So I learned a lot 
just from watching you. I remember you using uh, the the D2 steel. What tell us about that? I caught on to D2 steel because it had a lot of characteristics that were really good in one place. And that was the fact that it was a stainless. It was very tough steel, but it was it was fairly easy to work. And the other thing was that I could heat treat it myself. Mm -hmm. It wasn't one of those fancy steels right. that you have to have very high temperatures and double quench very and all controlled that. Controlled, yeah, controlled temperatures. Uh, and so I discovered D2, and it, I liked it. It was a good steel. Well, and you could sharpen it easily, and it held up pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, who you talked about David Boy, and that's B O Y E by the way, uh, and you can look him up. He's still he's still active, still making knives. Um, other than David Boy, who were some of the knife makers of the time that influenced your work? Well, my two heroes were Bob Loveless uh, and Bo Randall. They both made really, really nice knives, and they were active, and the quality was excellent. They had great designs. In fact, I, I, I bought a knife from Bo Randall at the time, well, and he still is doing it as we speak, uh, he forged all of his knives. And I thought right. that was that was neat because uh, that was another step to toughen steel yeah. that I did not have access to. You know, right. I, I was not a blacksmith or anything and I couldn't do that. Right. But his knives were wonderful and I bought one and I really liked it. It was well done. Bob Loveless uh, did lots of things. He did pocket knives and sheath knives and all kinds of stuff. And Yes, Bob Loveless has, uh, his designs have been much copied to this day. And yeah. it's a, he has a very straightforward drop point design. I even, I even called one time. I wanted to ask him, could you make a living making knives? Oh, yeah. Obviously, he seemed to be making a living making knives. Yeah. So I called him. And his wife answered. Hmm. <laughs> and she, he was busy, of course. I couldn't talk to Bob. So I asked his wife, I, said, uh, I just had a question. Can you make a living making knives? And she hung up on me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's interesting, um, this is something I don't think we've talked about before, but one of, one of Loveless's early students and kind of uh, a, a pro, I guess an apprentice was Steve Johnson, who went on to make knives that looked much like the Loveless knives. And he's from Utah. He's a Utah man. A Utah yep. man. Still lives in Utah. And Steve Johnson knives, I think, have about a five-year waiting list to get to get one right now. Well, I think Randall has about a six-year waiting list yeah. now. Yeah, they're, it's amazing. It is amazing. But I don't know if I could work under that kind of pressure. No. Now, you, you told me something once. Uh, I wanted to bring this up at some point. I remember when I started to make knives and you told me the day you make uh, knife making a business instead of a hobby, you will ruin it as a hobby. That's right. That's yeah. right. I started engraving my knives and I loved it. It was wonderful. Uh, I happened to live next door to a custom rifle maker, uh, excellent, excellent rifles. And one day he called me, he'd seen my engraving. One day he called me and said, I'd like you to do some engraving on some of these guns. And I turned him down yeah. because I didn't want or need that pressure. Right. And it is pressure. So you didn't actively sell the knives that you made i sold some yes sold a, few. a lot i gave yeah. away and my children stole the rest well i can't speak to that but uh anyway what kind of, what kind of uh what kind of knives did you make what style of well knives? like i said I, uh, I made folding knives and engraved them and then i made uh well, I don't know if you'd call it a camp knife or mm -hmm. kind of an outdoor knife. 
I was inspired by a single knife that was uh, touted by a man named Kephart, who wrote some books on wilderness living and survival, and uh, he had a lot to say about that. I had, I thought I had the book. Um, there's, there were a series of books written by Kephart mm -hmm. called Woodcraft. I believe one was called Woodcraft, and there was Camping and Woodcraft. They've, yep. They're now in one volume, but... And he was an outdoorsman. Yeah, he, he actually lived in the outdoors. He lived in the outdoors, and I believed everything he said. And he, he, was, he, he had a lot of uh, believability. And, and I read, I have read probably almost all of those books. As uh, have I. Every word. And it's fascinating stuff. Um, but he, you're right, he, uh, he talked a lot about the fact that the woodsman needed... Uh, kind of a trinity of tools, a good hunting knife, mm -hmm. a, a small hatchet for chopping wood and uh, building shelters, starting fires, whatever, and then a small, finer, you know, pocket knife type, mm -hmm. small bladed pocket knife. That got me thinking. Uh, I, I did an advanced degree in Western history, Western American history, 19th century particularly, and it encompassed the mountain men who were some of the great outdoorsmen mm. of, the, of the century and what kind of knives they used. And then I read about buffalo hunters, what kind of knives they used. Mm -hmm. And they were all a little different uh, in sense, but they were generalist knives. And then I might differentiate generalist and specific knives because they do exist. A specific knife is made to do one job and one job only. Right. Uh, a good example is the Fairbairn fighting knife of the Second World War yeah. that was designed for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is stabbing. Yeah. yeah. And that was it. Right. You, it was not a good knife for the wilderness. It, wasn't, it didn't take in Kephart's three specific tools at all. It was one tool to do one thing. A buffalo hunter was a specialist. Mm -hmm. I, they I, had one knife only, and it would look like a butcher knife. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, it had a curved back and, uh -huh. right, and kind of a hump. And in the they back. had to skin eight or ten buffaloes a day, which is yeah. pretty hard work, and cut them up. Yeah, yeah. But, the but then, the, so there's a difference between a specialist knife and a generalist knife. I was going to mention, and I, I wish I had the book here, but the, the Kephart book does have a picture drawn of what Kephart considered a good hunting knife. And interestingly, the Marbles Woodcraft knife, which we have one of, uh, is pretty much identical to the drawing he made mm -hmm. of what a good hunting knife would be. A good deep belly here uh, for skinning, cleaning an animal. Mm -hmm. So it's skinning Fish. and cutting. They yeah. don't stab the animals with it at all. Wouldn't be a chopping knife, really. Uh, not a chopping knife. They need an axe. Uh, sometimes the mountain men would use an axe to cut up a carcass. Yeah. Because, they, you know, they had... Uh, no real knife to to do some of the specialist things that they needed to do. Yeah. So I've often wondered about man's original tool and what it was used for. And I got to thinking about wilderness living or survival living in the wilderness, carrying a, a hatchet or an axe, a knife for cutting, so he's got chopping and cutting. Uh, I couldn't find any examples of a, of a mountain man using any saw or anything like that, but I'm sure some of the things they had to do with a cutting knife were not as specific as using something to saw it with or yeah. to use teeth to cut into something hard like bone. Right, and that's another another tool that I'm sure Kephart would have carried as a small saw mm -hmm. for cutting wood as well as 
possibly cut, you know, disarticulating a, an animal carcass and getting through the, the bones and the sinew. Um, so where, where we're kind of leading with this is, is you started to get ideas about making a more useful uh, kind of camp hunt survival type knife that would fill more than just one need, right? Not at that point. What got me thinking about that was a book that I read called The Tracker. Oh, yes. It was written by Tom Brown. I happen to have that here. And that, that, in, that was an influence on me. I was very taken with, with the book. Now, it's, it's written as a novel, right? It's almost like a novel. In fact, I couldn't believe some of the things that uh, Tom Brown got into in the book, but it got me thinking about somebody who really was out there in the wilderness and needed a tool. And he talked about knives in the book and using them. And I thought, there must be a single concept for a knife for a person that uses it constantly, all day, every day. And that's that's a survivalist, that's a, a wilderness roamer, if you will, somebody who lives out uh, in the wild with uh, kind of off the grid, if, if you want to right, say that. Right. And so I thought, well, this book has inspired me to think about about a wilderness knife. I wonder what Tom Brown would say if I asked him what makes a good knife. Mm -hmm. So I wrote him a letter. And I said, I'm a knife maker and I've read your book. And uh, it was very interesting to me. And I wonder what you think a good knife entails and how to use it. We actually, I could think of no one better. Yeah. No, that was a great idea. And he did write you back, correct? He wrote me back a small, a small note, if you will, not a, not a big letter. Um, I kept it. Yeah, there. Okay, here. This is this is the actual. I've got this laminated. Uh, here's the letter and the the envelope uh, that it came in, addressed to my father, and and Tom Brown's response. You want to read uh, some of that? Just to, just to this, this is dated April 14th, 1981. This is about the time that I was, that I'd read the book and I was thinking, what is a good knife? He said, hi, sorry I haven't written, but I've been on the road for the past six weeks and just got back a few days ago. Knives are our, our most useful and basic of all tools, and it is very hard to live without one in the wilderness. I can't argue with that. It is possible, though, to make a temporary one out of obsidian, bone, or flint. This is the early knives we were talking about. Though these generally are of poor quality and do not last very long. Well, that's obvious. It has long been a problem to find the perfect knife for the woods, and I find that most of all, my, my advanced students, the, I don't think we mentioned he does have, he did carry on a survival school, school yeah. at this time and had students come in to learn how to live in the in the wilderness, if you will. He talked about his, his students carrying more than one knife with them. Ah, this, in other words, this is, wilderness living is not as not a it's a generalist living. It's, it sounds like they're, he's, they're different functions. Sounds like he's headed toward uh -huh. the Kephart. The Kephart thought that, that, yeah. that there are many, well, at least three tools that you need to have with you. And they, they usually carry three of them, he said, as students. One is small, sharp pocket knife for, for close work, a medium skinning knife for skinning and making most of the items used in survival, and a big heavy knife for throwing and chopping. Well, I'm not into throwing knives, and I'm not sure a good woodsman... I mean, this is the movies. Well, yeah. This is what the movies. What would you do with a throwing knife? You're not going to yeah. use throwing knives. But for chopping and hacking. So those are three things, three main things that he brought out, and I agree with them. Yeah. As I gave thought to my experience, those are the three tools and, and activities that I use. 
out camping, out hiking, out living right. off the grid. Needless to say, said Brown, having all these knives caused a problem with carrying too many things with you. So he's saying we need an all-around knife to survive if you want to include all of those functions in one tool. Mm -hmm. It has to be indestructible. He thought it had to be a large knife, like a Bowie knife. I didn't quite agree with that. Uh, carrying something like that around, uh, I'm I'm not sure is the thing you'd really want to oh, do. Yeah. It, it, you got to carry that all day. That's your only your, tool. You have to put it in your pack, and then yeah. it wouldn't be available. Yeah. And right. anyway, so that's what that's what Tom said, and he said here. Generally, it should have, you know, good heft and, you know, there is talks about balance. And, of course, we both yeah. know about balance of, of that tool. Right. And he said, if you could make such a knife, let me know. And I let my students purchase it. So I have over 10,000 students. <laughs> wow. So there's my a... schools in the past two years. That's a lot of knives. At any rate. So he had some that he had some answer. good general ideas for you, um, not anything specific about a knife design and just the uh, functions. Obviously, he wasn't a knife designer or maker himself, but obvi but obviously he said there's a market for it. Yes, and he had access to that market. That got my attention, of course. So you you started to do some design work, and I actually have some of the original vellum drawings you did of mm -hmm. some of your designs uh, as you started to develop a knife that might fill these needs. Yes, I did. I did some vellum uh, concept, conceptual shapes yeah. of, of different knives and put them, overlaid them one with the other and see how they could be changed. And I can see that a lot of the what you're going for here is a front chopping edge, mm -hmm. and then this edge being curved or straight. Well, I thought, I thought there's got to be some good use for that. Yeah, this is this is more than a chopping knife. Yeah, there's you've got cutting. Yeah, and the chopper is not a good cutter. Right, you still you still need to do skinning like you would do yeah, with and skinning. This and that goes about the, the, the blade, so there's, there's many functions you can I incorporate. And I came up with, after nights of, of fooling around, I came up with a design. Now I have here, uh, and I've laminated this because it's a very interesting piece of history. This is where I, you pretty much came down to one of two final designs, Mod 1 and Mod 2, you mm -hmm. called them. And you've got the blade shape and then this the handle scale that would go on it. Uh, yeah. And what read what it says on the, the top of that page. Well, I wrote tracker knife. 513.81. 513.81, interestingly, uh, was my 18th birthday. So, ah. I, again, I was, this was something I remembered well. And I remember how you had come to the, arrived at this final design. Now, mm -hmm. this mod two really became your final pattern. It did. And right there, I put a, I put a, a cutting, a cutting blade. Right. And then this edge here is curved. Uh, you could use sharp, it kind of as, sharp, a, as a semi uh, uh, gut hook. Scraping or even for that gut matter, hook, yeah. pulling. So it would be pulling. sharp all the way down. This is, yeah, this would be a, a, yeah. cho a chopping blade. That's a cut parts hatchet and cut parts cutter. You can use this for skinning. In right. fact, I have a friend who skinned a bear with it. And we don't, uh, it's not shown on that drawing, but here we see That's saw the third, teeth. The third tool. Yeah. What a nice place. It's going to waste up there. Why don't we put some saw teeth up there? Right, right. So yeah, I did. Very, very interesting. Um, it's, it's interesting that saw teeth on a knife were not were not unheard of. Um, Randall made a model that uh, had some saw teeth on the back. Ah, I even found them in Windsor Castle in England. 
it, I, I want to hear about that, but I was going to mention one other thing that the marbles, the marbles company that made this knife made a, a, a design that I think they called the pilot survival knife. And it was specifically for uh, flyers and it had teeth all the way down the back. Uh-huh. And, uh, I get, I mean, ostensibly that would be probably for cutting webbing, parachute webbing or something to get them out of the mm, cockpit if they crashed. Yeah. But, my my idea was not to, <clears throat> to go the, the full back. That top platform on the blade that I had on on the design, yeah, I awesome. thought would be sufficient because you could you could pull that and push that, and you wouldn't have have this near your hand, right? And you could do some some serious work with that without having it to, having your hand go close to what you're working on. So I. I kept it up on the platform. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a very natural place for, mm-hmm. for teeth up there. You've got this unused flat spot. And uh, with the rest of the design with a curve here, wouldn't you wouldn't want teeth in there. It's just no. going to get in the way. No, because you put your thumb in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, taking this final design, you developed a prototype knife, right? Yes, I built one. You know, one knife. I built it up uh, according to that design, and I, it was, it was some some of it was pretty tricky work for me and and my home workshop. I didn't have some yeah. of the tools that I really needed. What but I did my best. What were the the materials you used? The steel you used and the handle material for that that well, prototype. D two immediately came to my mind because I could heat treat that myself. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't a, a designer alloy or anything like that. It was just a good, honest good steel. Tool it was steel. very tough. I could uh, I could heat treat it myself, and I could do all of the the work easily without uh, without having to send it off somewhere. Find it off. Send it off to to a big yeah. shop to do. And micarta, which was. What kind of material was micarta? Well, it's kind of a layered, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not thinking plastic. What's the composite. other Composite. Yeah. It, yeah, it, a phenolic composite. A phenolic. Yeah. And it was tough. It, uh, it was cheap. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, I could work it myself, and, and it finished off pretty nicely, too, with what I could do with it. So that was my choice for the handle, uh, something that would stand up to hard use. Right. So what what did you ultimately do with this this prototype survival well, knife or tracker I, knife? As you I needed, it? I needed somebody to look at it that that had experience. So I sent it off to Tom Brown. To, I yes, sent, to, sent him the actual prototype. I sent him the knife. Yeah. Uh, to get his reaction to it, and it it was worth <clears throat> sacrificing a knife, I guess, if I had to, if he wanted to keep it, and he did, obviously, mm-hmm. and uh, to get his reaction to it to see if I was on the right track. So what what happened after that? You got a letter. You got a letter back. Yep. And again, this is a letter that we have. Um, Written on the the tracker letterhead, Tom Brown. Tom Brown Tracker, Inc. in New Jersey. By the way, Tom Brown operated his tracking school in New Jersey. In the Pine Barrens. The Pine Barrens of New New Jersey. Jersey. Um, Do you want to read some of the... Well, I got a great letter from from Tom Brown. And what's it dated? June 19th, 1981. 1981, okay. Dear Rob, the knife you sent me is beautiful. Better than any knife I've ever used before. That made me feel good. With a little time I have had it, I have put it through some tough tests. And that's why I chose D2. I knew that probably somebody was going to give it some tough tests. Needless to say, it has far surpassed my expectations, no matter what changes the knife goes through, I am going to keep this one as my best because it is the first knife that anyone has made for me. 
Hmm. So we're getting an indication that he was not a knife maker and had not consulted oh, with no, anyone that, else. That's right. For a knife. Well, uh, you know, he, he, of course, if he needed a knife he had and he could make it, he would have done it by now, I yeah. don't think. Um, so he tells me that when he had it, when he received it, he, was, he had a class, a survival class running, and he showed the knife to his class, and he said they all loved it. And the knife was passed around and used heavily all week long, ending in the best of comments with no complaints. Needless to say, they all wanted one. And I called the calls I got from their friends after they left my class. I could have sold over 80 knives. Well, that got my attention. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. There's your market. There's a market for that knife. And if Tom says he could have sold them to all his class. He says, I have a funny feeling that when the knife is finally complete, you may have to open a private shop just to fill the orders you get from the school. I'm not kidding. Figuring that I've graduated over 6,000 people in the past two years. Wow. That's a market. Yeah, that's a market. And here I was. Just full-time just, work. Just one hobbyist knife maker. You know, a hobby knife maker. Yeah. So he wanted me to come to the to the school. I meet the students. Yeah. Unfortunately, I had a job. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't I couldn't do it. That's clear to New Jersey. Yeah. And I'll show close-ups of these letters later. Um, so you. You had something going here, the knife maker and the survivalist. Uh, seems like we had a good match up. Uh, you could mm -hmm. make the knives. He had a market for them. Uh, he had his students that would obviously want to buy them. So it sounds like it would have made a, a great business venture. Well, I was. I thought, well, if I could even sell sell, sell two or three, yeah. handmade by me, they they wouldn't be a production knife. Yeah. But I think they could be special if some of these students were really serious about owning one. Mm -hmm. So I looked around. I started to talk with local machinists and things. Uh, you know, what would you charge me to make a blank? Because you were thinking big. I mean, more than you could produce by more yourself. More than I could do one at a time. Yeah. And we have we actually have uh, again some documents you saved uh, where you had scoped out this. This page talks about. A run of a hundred knives, and what it would, what all of your costs would be for fabrication, and then they, these would be hand finished knives, but a lot of the, you'd get a lot of the work uh, done by a. I machinist. could part part it out. Yeah, if, to use the term. So this interesting. This first sheet is would be for a run of one hundred knives, and the total cost was six thousand seven hundred and ninety dollars. So. Sixty-seven ninety per knife mm -hmm. would be the cost to make them. And it, uh, not that, a bad price. Yeah, not a bad price. But in nineteen eighty-two, that's nineteen eighty-two is a lot of money. That's an expensive knife. Yeah, yeah. Um, you did another another uh, set of figures for five hundred knives, which would be twenty-six thousand seven hundred and forty dollars. But that brought the cost down to fifty-three forty-eight each. So, and again, I'll show these later. So, you ran the numbers. Um, you you ran, you gave this information back to Tom Brown in another mm -hmm. letter, um, and started to get, I guess, what you could call a gentleman's agreement to to do business together. And there was never any kind of contract or uh, or anything like that, was there? Well, no, I. I I had the idea of all these students wanting this knife, you know, and going through the school. There must be a way we could get this to them yeah. in some way without me quitting a very nice job that I had and going into knife making full time. Uh, so this is interesting. We have another letter. And this was written back by, by Tom Brown. This is a... Again, laminated actual letter from 
Tom Brown on his letterhead. This one is dated May 10th, 1982. Another so, year has gone by. Well, yeah, a year has gone by since you initially drew that uh, design and made the knife. And I, I'll, I'll let you read from that. But uh, So he had some information on what it would cost to make the knife. And how did he respond to that? Dear Rob, sorry that it has taken me so long to get back in touch. It was, it was a while. Uh, in touch with you, but things around here have been hectic, to say the least. This is handwritten, and so it's a little tough to, to read. read it. We have only 16 orders for the tracker knife, and about the same... For the Skinner, I didn't mention I made a little skinning knife for him also because in his book, The Tracker, he talks about skinning deer out yeah. and a few things and getting the meat. So this was, a, as I remember, this was just a little, was just a tiny little, little knife to be a companion to the... Uh, to be a companion with the, the other, other knife. Uh, Let's see, uh, about the same for uh, the Skinner, 16 orders. If we have the money here, I suspect that orders will dribble in a little at a time, and it will take a long time to get 100 orders. This is not what he said in his first letter. Yeah. He had a he had. A hundred people wanting the knife immediately. and Well, now he kind of had a price for it. Well, that's right. The price so, may have slowed it down. Maybe, maybe that slowed it down. I guess we will just have to charge the higher price and take the longer time to produce the knife. I do have a few questions to ask about the knife, and uh, we'll be in touch with phone sometime within the next few weeks. What, and I think on the back he has some questions he Good asked questions what is your cost for making the knife in other words what do we send you for each order now that would be if you made them by hand i think uh -huh. right yeah uh, I, I did quote him that yeah how long will it take to produce the knife how much extra will the sheath be we didn't mention a sheath at all yeah so uh, there's a, another thing that has to be made is it going to be too much work for you to do these knives? Can I get a finished product for my own personal knife? Well, he has one already. Yeah. <laughs> Including sheath for my own personal knife. And how much would that cost? Which made me wonder, what does he need another knife for? Yeah. I don't know. I wonder if he's going to show it around to knife makers. That's a possibility. I don't know. We'll be talking to you soon, Tom. All right. So, so that... the 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 nasty the nasty cost has come out. Yeah. Of a, of a hobby knife maker trying to produce a knife and hold down a full time job. Yeah. So it was a good idea. He liked the knife design. He had people interested in it, but. It, again, it was probably the cost of a handmade knife that was slowing down any uh, mass orders for knives. I think it was the cost that he thought he could get from me. Mm -hmm. And it was higher than he thought. Right. And it was, of course, a little higher than I had expected, too. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a complex knife. Um, oh, yes. Not well, a many, simple not, knife yes. to yes. make. With the uh, varying bevels, the saw teeth on the back, uh, not not a not a typical uh, typical. We both know make. that since we've we've done it. Yeah, yeah. And now many years later, and I've been making knives for over twenty years and selling them. I, I fully understand that. Um, now something interesting that I was to find out later that we didn't know about was that he published his own newsletter called the, the tracker newsletter and it's full of just all kinds of little things about uh how to, wilderness living yeah wilderness living and there's some photos and there's some drawings of clothes clothing and different things but what's interesting is right in the middle 
uh, and I, I laminated this, the middle part of this, to make it a little, a little better to read this. You got a but, close up of that. Yeah, we'll get a close up of that. But it has a section called knives, and it says, the Tom Brown Tracker Survival Knife is made exclusively for Tom by Rob Russon, a custom knife designer. This knife does an outstanding job for the serious survivalist. Take a look at the picture to really appreciate what this knife can do. And there's a drawing of the knife. I hope our lighting is still looking here. There's a drawing of the knife with all of the measurements. Need some more light? Okay, that'll help. Uh, a drawing of the knife, which again is interesting because he has he has your prototype knife. Mm -hmm. Why not show a photo of that? Mm -hmm. But it describes all of the features That's of the knife. not quite my knife. Yeah, it's been mutated a little bit. It's fatter up here. Some Maybe he couldn't get it on the page. I don't know. He also shows this the little skinning knife. The skinning that, knife that you know, I made. <laughs> but he has on here, uh, underneath the knife it says, the price of this custom-made knife would be $200. Delivery time will depend on number of orders. If you want to order, blah, blah, blah. And there's a price on the skinning knife, too. So That made me wonder where he got that. Yeah, $200 knife is... That's a that's a hefty price for a knife for anybody at that time. Uh, but he was advertising it as being available. So, but you never saw any orders for knives. After I gave Tom the my estimate, I never heard from him again. Right. So again, this we didn't know about this newsletter. No, I didn't until know a bit about it. Many years later, but this came out in. Now, this issue was March, April, and May of 1982. So, right around the time that he last wrote you. So, there was some, some things going on there that uh, he wasn't exactly forthright about. Well, he couldn't, he couldn't be forthright because I never heard from him. Right, right. <laughs> I, I, it was as if he had dropped into the into a black hole somewhere yeah. and that was it and yet we see here that he had he was advertising this knife this tracker knife for sale he did give you credit for being the the designer and maker of this knife mm -hmm. and had a price on it but that was the last you ever heard of the Tom last Brown. i heard from him yeah 1982 well, a year later yeah a year later um so as far as you knew the the I thought he'd given the up tracker knife was over. Yeah. I thought he he couldn't he couldn't see how it could be done. Right. With me. And I I know you did try to contact him. Mm -hmm. Uh I can't remember if you said by by letter or by phone or both and just couldn't get a response couldn't back. Couldn't get, get a reaction. Yeah. So again, this seemed to be the end of the tracker knife story. In my mind, it was. Right. That was it. So, the, uh, the continuation of this story is very interesting and picks up about almost 20 years later. Um, I was a knife maker. Um, I was making my own designs. And I taught you. And you taught me. <laughs> and I was making... Some of my knives I made from patterns that uh, you had given me. What was interesting was that I still had the, the, original. the, the original steel pattern in D2 steel of your tracker knife. And this is it. This is the one you cut out and shaped mm -hmm. right. as your pattern. I made it. And I still had this. Uh, I, early on in my adventures as a knife maker i decided to take that pattern and make make a knife as i as i could best remember you having made the prototype so this knife is made to this design you can see it's got the the teeth on the back but it's made exactly to this design with the the micarta handles the brass pins um a little thumb jimping for the thumb thumb rest and the jimping means a place for your thumb 
A place for your thumb, yeah, the gripping. A lot of knives don't have that, and yet yeah. uh, I'm surprised because when I was hunting deer, I, I wished I'd had something on those knives that I yeah. was using to help me push. Yeah, push. So this was one, and it's a sheath I made for it. This was a knife I made, um, I don't remember when, long time ago. Just to kind of, I found that, I remember finding the blank and thinking, oh, I should make one of these and have one around. And I, and I used it. It's got some use on it. But, um, again, nothing was really happening. I kept that blank around, uh, thinking maybe someday to do something with it. But as a knife maker, I subscribe to a magazine which i know for a long time you you had a subscription to this blade magazine blade. yep that was the that was the knife magazine of uh for america for yeah for knife knife fanatics and knife makers um so in april of 2003 and that's how many years after 1982 <laughs> uh it's basically 13 what is it? Let's see. That's it's twenty years. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Twenty years later. Okay, I get the April two thousand three Blade Blade magazine, and I remember pulling this out of my mailbox, and literally in shock, saw on the cover of it, and we'll get a, a close up of this later, your tracker knife. And I see uh, an actor here, and it talks about the, uh, it says the tracker. And I see on the knife, Tom Brown tracker, written on the knife. And there's an article in here about a movie that was made called The Hunted, in which uh, Paramount, the maker of the movie, consulted with one Tom Brown, a well-known tracking instructor on certain aspects of the movie where there were some and designer uh, of a unique knife he, tom brown claimed to be the designer of this very unique looking knife um that he called his tracker knife it's got saw teeth on the back and the, the design obviously very very familiar to us i was really i was really totally shocked when i saw this and I read the article, and I, I read about Tom Brown, saw his name in there, and all the pieces fell together. I mean, I knew, I knew where this knife came from. I was there when it was conceived. And now here it is in a movie and on the front of a magazine. And it was just, I was flabbergasted. So I remember calling you up. You didn't, I don't think you had a copy of it yet or, or weren't subscribing anymore, but I called you up and told you, what I saw on the front of this magazine and uh, what kind of, what was your feeling about that? There's a term called gobsmacked. <laughs> I was gobsmacked. <laughs> I felt, uh, well, I felt sick. Yeah. Because I knew, immediately I knew what he'd done and I knew what had happened and I knew why I'd never heard again from him. It was very obvious, and uh, had, I've never, had, I've never had such a dismal feeling in my life. So he had, according to the article, um, worked with a man named Dave Beck, David Beck, who was a knife maker, and it was apparently a, a version of this knife made by David Beck that was used in the movie. Um, it's a little confusing on the article because the knife you see is made by a company called Tops, which is a knife company in Idaho. That was actually not the knife used in the movie. The one used in the movie was made by David Beck. So there's some conf confusing aspects to this story that I tried to. But work they out. all look alike. They're all the same design. They're all the same knife, right? So. I wanted to figure out what had happened, but I also was, I have to admit, I was, uh, on your behalf, upset that something that you made, you designed, someone else is taking credit for. And, of course, my first thought, like anybody, would be, 
dad, you got to sue this guy. You, this is your knife. And what was your reaction to that? Well, that's not what I am. I, I'm not a, I'm not a person who sues other, other people. I, I just let it go. Mm. Uh, it, it took a while to let it go. In fact, as I look at the magazine right now, I'm getting that old feeling back. Yeah. Well, I remember that you came to me, and again, we've, we've looked at all these letters and uh, your designs and the magazine and so forth, and I remember you came to me, and you handed me this folder that said the tracker on it, and you said, this is all the stuff I have about the design of the knife, my correspondence with Tom Brown, take it and do what you want with it. Um, I didn't know what that was, but I, I did know that I wanted to find out more about how it had what had happened in those 20 years to go from your prototype knife to now something that's in a movie and i i, th I think we can we can decide that a lot had happened, <laughs> a lot had happened but i didn't know a thing about it and here was a knife that now was as famous as a movie prop as the the rambo knife the rambo was to knife be. another iconic knife and that was to be uh, to come out right after, or, uh, sorry, yeah, it came out in 1982, which was right after you were designing this knife. Um, some, some, I'm not saying there's any uh, correlation between there's the no Rambo There's no similarity, knife and this. really, between the two, but the concept is kind of there. The teeth on the back of the knife. Yeah. Uh, it's a kind of a Bowie style knife. But and again, we're not, not claiming anything there. I'm just saying that no, the, no. the Rambo knife became something that everybody wanted because of the movie. Now, because of the, the hunted, everybody wanted this tracker knife. Oh, yes. Just... I can imagine what the sales must have been yeah. after that. So apparently a company named Topps Knives in Idaho was now going to mass produce this knife for Tom Brown. He had a huge market of people that, that wanted this this movie prop knife and tops was going to make it for tom brown um so i started i started doing some research on this and it took a long time because i had to unravel this trail of what had happened and there was really no evidence other than this article where they interviewed tom brown and he said i designed this knife a long time ago and uh, I they asked me to help with the movie and I brought my knife to them and you know all of that I knew there was a lot more to it than that so it was to take me about 20 years more to really find out everything there was a man that I got in contact named Bo Gulledge from Kentucky and he told me a lot of the missing pieces. He had been a student of Tom Brown uh, in the tracking school. He had spent time with Tom Brown and his family uh, on different outings and, and so forth, been over to his house for dinner. He had, uh, he said, I've got a knife made by a man named Ed Lombie. I never heard of Ed Lombie, so I uh, looked him up was only able to find one picture online. So this was, by now, the internet existed and I could start to do some research. But what I found out was that Tom Brown had gone to this knife maker, Ed Lombie, and had him make some tracker knives for him. But he called it the medicine blade. The picture I found was unmistakably your knife, but it had wood handles and then it, uh, etched on the side was medicine blade. And what I learned from Bo Gulledge was that, that uh, Ed Lombie, a knife maker, had made by hand a certain number of these knives that mostly that were given to Tom Brown's inner circle, uh, his inner, inner cadre of, of supporters that he called Coyote Thunder, according to Bo. And he gave them all one of these knives, and Bo ended up with one of one of them. But there weren't very many made. He estimated there were maybe, I don't know, maybe 20 of these knives made by Ed Lombie. 
Uh, I really could not find out a lot about Ed Lombie, except that he was uh, a knife maker. And uh, the connections that I made were that he, Tom Brown had taken your prototype knife, likely, to Ed Lombie and said, make this for me. And he probably got a lot better price than uh, Perhaps he what saw you gave him. When he was a student yeah. in the survival School. Exactly, exactly. Because we know that, that people had seen your prototype because he, he mentioned in his letter that his students loved the knife. So what I was to find out was that Ed Lombie has, had made some knives and then the design went to a man named Dave Beck who was mentioned in the uh, magazine article that Dave Beck then made the medicine blade or the tracker knife as it started to be called after that uh, for Tom Brown. Uh, Dave Beck was a knife maker out of Pennsylvania, um, very talented knife maker. In fact, he made a really stellar version of the knife by hand. So Dave Beck had, had made quite a few of uh, a continuation of the tracker knife. He continued making them for Tom Brown. And I think it was for over 10 years he made the knives for Tom Brown. And again, did a really great job of it. But I actually, I wasn't able to to find the, this Ed Lombie, but I was able to get a hold of Dave Beck. And we had a nice long phone conversation. And I told him who I was and I told him my story and he said, you know, when I first saw that knife from Tom Brown that Ed Lombie had made, and it, which he said, now, you know, make this knife for me. He said, it was a little crude, but he said, I, I sensed that there was more behind the design than Tom Brown just thinking this up and having Ed Lombie make it. He said, it, was, it seemed to be a very intelligently designed knife. And he was able to interpret what you really had intended for the knife. And he made a great version of it. But he actually was not surprised that uh, this chain of events had happened. He had worked with Brown for quite a few years. He, he indicated that the, the rug had kind of been pulled out from under him as well. Because when they got the knife... Beck's knife into the movie The Hunted, all of a sudden Beck was cut out of the picture <laughs> because he couldn't make them fast enough. <laughs> he was he made knives one at a time by hand. Now the movie made this knife extremely popular, and so Tom Brown needed to have somebody mass produce them, and that that's where Tops came in. And Tops to this day makes the quote, Tom Brown tracker knife in, uh, in mass production. So that, again, that took me almost 20 years to find all of that information out. Um, and I've compiled a lot of, a lot of um, additional information on top of what you have. But the question was, what, what do I do with this information? Uh, so now we, we kind of know how it got there. In fact, I, I called a man named Mike Fuller, who founded Topps Knives in Idaho. I got a hold of him. He had since kind of retired from uh, playing a lead role in running the company. But he told me the story of how Tom Brown brought him this knife. He said, we want to, to produce this knife. And he told me that he, he said, we had to make a few little changes to it to make it manufacturable. Um, because again, it was it was an interesting knife. It had some interesting geometry, and they had to make a few little changes to make it more easily mass produced. Um, and we talked a little bit about his his do dealings with Tom Brown. Uh, he told me an interesting story. He said he said he's an interesting man. He he has a lot of stories to tell about how he apparently grew up in the woods and. Uh, hunted deer and tracked animals but he claimed that he, Tom Brown, claimed that in 1963 he had made his first knife the, the predecessor to the tracker by hand himself out of uh, forging a 
leaf spring of a truck into a knife. Now, I did the math, and in 1963, which is the year I was born, Tom Brown would have been 13 years old. So the story of a 13-year-old boy forging a knife out of a truck spring, which is 5160 uh, carb, uh, spring steel, very tough material, very About thick. About a fourth of an inch thick, maybe even oh, more. Oh, even more. more probably, probably close to half an inch half thick. Half an inch. And having to forge that down into a knife is utterly unbelievable but uh, and and mike fuller kind of had a chuckle about this story as well he said uh, he says you know i don't know what to believe about that but he said uh, that was the story i got but again he mike fuller a very nice man very had a very nice conversation with him but all he could really tell me was he said you know i don't know where this knife came from it was brought to us as made by david beck and we we made our version of it with some changes that Tom wanted. It was made larger, thicker, heavier, heavy, nearly two pounds. Yeah. Uh, in comparison with a much lighter, more easily wielded knife that you had designed, but it was still uh, my concept was you've got to carry this thing all day. Yeah, yeah. And uh... the the most interesting thing is that this pattern is so universally recognized now i even saw one made in italy oh yeah i've seen them made in uh, all over the world pakistan china india everyone has copied this knife now if you look up tracker knife on the internet you'll find them you'll find copies everywhere made in damascus steel and all kinds of things um so again this left me wondering well, what what now uh, what can I do? I'd really like my dad to have some credit for having designed this knife. And so we talked about it and decided that maybe what we'd do, um, at least to get you some, some recognition, is uh, make your knife. We did a limited run. We had them made in China. And I added a couple of my own modifications to the knife to kind of make it a collaboration um but we we produced what we call the survivor knife now this really is if you hold these together it's the same pattern however i added this gut hook on the back which can also be used for slicing leather for cutting uh shaving bark off of sticks became a kind of a utility hook uh, it's got the cross-cut teeth up here, very sharp diamond teeth. That's an improvement on my design. I just yeah. had uh, a, a saw cut. More of a that like that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so the, the teeth, we did the teeth a lot better. Um, it's got the same thumb riser there with the, the jimping. And then I, I added this protrusion on the pommel, uh, which I call a hammer, so that you could use it for you know hammering stakes in the ground or or uh, cracking nuts or whatever you needed to bash with the knife without damaging the handle handle so that that was an addition there other than that it's the same knife and we were able to sell 250 of these 250. Yeah. yeah and they went pretty quick um but that was kind of the end of that uh uh, over 13,000 people have watched my YouTube video telling this story. And uh, I've had a lot of great positive feedback from people. Um, which brings us to today. And the story is not over yet. Uh, my idea was that we would use Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding platform, as, as a lot of people know, to bring back the classic Rob Russin tracker knife, exactly as you designed it in 1981. Just like I gave to Tom Brown. Exactly. And the closest thing we have to what that would have looked like is probably this one that I made by hand, though. I'm not really proud of the work on this. This I was a young knife maker at the time, but this is, this is what we were shooting for because this is... Oh, here's the pattern. This is... 
it's hard to, to hold it on there. Show a tight shot of that. But we'll get a tight shot of that, but that's the knife. 11 and a half inches long, and we want to match that pattern exactly. No modifications, no additions. It will be more or less the classic tracker knife as designed by you, Rob Russell. So that's what this campaign is about, to get some support from people to produce this knife and bring back the original knife as it should have been released. Then we can make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>